good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Steve Aycock. I'm the judge in residence at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Uh, and I've been working for the last uh, about eight years on firearms and protection order issues. And this is Nancy Hart. I'm a senior program attorney with the National Council. Um, I've been with the Council for almost four years working on civil protection order issues and firearms and uh, have worked on firearms and protection order issues over the decades prior to that. We're, um, this, this webinar con this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, concerns firearm for forfeiture in domestic violence cases because, can we forward to the next slide? Um, So the webinar today concerns firearms forfeitures in domestic abusers' access to firearms is a huge risk factor for intimate partner homicide. Um, compared to homes without guns, the presence of firearms is associated with a threefold increase in the homicide risk. And that risk increases to eightfold when the offender is an intimate partner of the victim and 20-fold when there's a prior history of violence. So these figures and statistics show that this is a, a, a problem that reaches great proportions. And we, we designed this webinar, and it's the previous webinar, part one, which I'll review briefly, um, because we, would, we want to have information out there about not only the laws that exist, but also how to create effective systems for implementing those laws. So as I mentioned, we had a first webinar back in early December, and some of you may have listened in on that. Um, others of you may not have. It's not a. It, 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 we just want to briefly review what we covered in that because we won't be covering that today. Um, the focus of that webinar was to review the federal laws on firearm forfeiture in domestic violence cases, and uh, we talked primarily about two amendments to the Gun Control Act. One was in 1994 with the Violence Against Women Act, and that passed 18 U.S. Code 922C, both 8 and 9, those first two that are listed there on the slide. Um, sorry, not D9, D8 and, D and uh, G8, which prohibited the transfer or sale to someone who was subject to a protection order and then correspondingly prohibited the possession by someone who was subject to a protection order. And then in 1996, the um, paragraph D provisions were added to the Gun Control Act, and that was the Lautenberg Amendment. And on the screen, that's your second and fourth bullet, the paragraphs that, the provisions that concern pro prohibiting the transfer or sale to someone who's convicted of misdemeanor or domestic violence crime, and then prohibiting someone who is convicted of a domestic violence crime from possessing a firearm. We didn't talk about it during the webinar in December, but another important federal law around fi federal firearm law is the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, which um, requires federally licensed firearms dealers to do a criminal background check before completing a sale. Um, there's a checkbox on, in, on some protection orders, or, and there's certainly paperwork that needs to be filled out in order for that Brady flag to uh, get into the system to prohibit those sales. You'll see a, a link to that webinar content down in the lower portion of your slide. If, at, uh, after you're finished with this, if you want to review some more details of those laws, that would be covered in that. But today we're going to focus on the civil side, not the criminal side of these um, of these federal laws. And what we want to start with is a few questions about your jurisdiction. Questions about the process that happens in your jurisdiction around it on the civil side of the federal firearms, uh, or, or civil side of firearms prohibition. So first, we would like to ask, do you have a process in your jurisdiction to identify if there are weapons? 
and how many and who has them. Just waiting to see how many of you uh, we have 19 responses so far. Okay, so it's interesting. We show about 60% uh, saying that you do have a process um, and about 40% saying that you don't have a process in your jurisdiction for identifying weapons. Our second question for you this morning or this afternoon is do you have a process or order in your jurisdiction for the surrender of firearms, again, in the civil protection order setting? Do you have a process or order for the surrender of firearms? Here you'll see that we are seeing a, almost three quarters of you are saying that you do have a process for ordering the surrender of firearms in a civil protection order. And then third, we would like um, to ask, do you have a process in your jurisdiction for the return of firearms, again, in the civil side on the protection order side? And we would encourage all of you to answer if you're if uh, you're allowed to, if your technology allows you to do so. <laughs> because these are the things that we're going to go into greater depth in on the webinar, and we wanted to know how many of you already had some processes in place. So again, it looks like about well, it looks like about two thirds, maybe a little bit more. Um, have a, process, a specific process for returns of firearms after the protection order is no longer in place. Thank you. Yes, thank you for answering. So this is what we're going to talk about today, creating an effective system to address DV cases involving firearms. And we know that there are challenges uh, to creating such a system, but we're going to cover these. Uh, but uh, you know, collaboration with your non-court stakeholders is extremely important with advocates, police department, other people uh, outside the court uh, who are touching the protection order and firearms um, issues in your jurisdiction. Um, remember that regardless of your own state law, federal law still applies. and. Uh, you should have a good relationship with um, either the federal courts or the federal prosecutor. Again, as Nancy just mentioned, there are uh, federal firearms that talk about what's legal, what's not, what's not legal. Uh, we'll also spend a little bit of time, not very much, on the Fifth Amendment, and then we're going to finish with judicial leadership. And here are what we consider the six elements of an effective system. And we're going to go through each one of those separately today. So let's start on the first one, getting the information about firearms. So there's lots of different ways that you can get this information. So uh, through advocacy, uh, most jurisdictions have something on their petitions or in their affidavits that has a space for petitioners to um, indicate whether or not the respondent has weapons or does not have weapons. Sometimes there are supplemental forms. Training around this issue is extremely important so that we know, uh, so that you're comfortable knowing that you're getting the majority of information about firearms. 
And then, of course, civil and criminal court records are really important because knowing whether somebody has a past protection order, whether there was a finding of domestic violence in a previous um, custody case, and obviously then uh, misdemeanors and felonies will be important in uh, figuring out what firearms are going to be legal and what aren't legal. And, and one of the reasons that training is listed there and why it's so important is that th some of the petitions may not ask, but it may be a matter of advocates asking an applicant prior to the application process whether there are firearms in the home or whether the uh, abuser has access to firearms and making um, ha having that advocate be trained and uh, or the court personnel be trained on what kinds of questions are useful to ask and what kind of information can be conveyed to the applicant so she knows what her options are with respect to um, identifying weapons and, and the consequences that she may face and, and just so that the training has to do with making sure that both the advocates and the court staff and, and others involved are aware of the consequences for the applicant when uh, firearms are involved. And, and we have a, uh, not a question, but a statement uh, about not being aware of the follow through, uh, even though they ask for weapons removal. And it's important not just for the court to be in contact with the non-court stakeholders, it's important for each of you as a stakeholder to be involved and in contact with all of the other stakeholders. And if you have a coordinated community response, this is the place where you can actually ask this question. So. What happens after we ask for removal? It's on the order. What happens? Uh, and the other stakeholder partners should be able to answer that for you. We're going to look at uh, a number of forms today, and we're not going to spend any much time on any one of them. Uh, we just want to give you some examples. And if you look on the uh, right-hand side, there's uh, Firearms Webinar M, which is now highlighted. That has a list of, all of these forms by slide number and a link to where you can find the, fine, the form. Uh, but here's a Wisconsin form, and basically what it does is it asks, you know, are there firearms? So, no, I do not know that he has firearms, or yes, I believe the respondent currently or within the past six months possessed firearms. And then, of course, you see the level of detail below because it's important for the court to have information about, you know, the quantity, the location, the make and model, the serial number, any information that can be captured um, at the beginning is, is helpful to have. And, and it's oftentimes, you know, a petitioner may say, well, I know he has a firearm, but I don't know what it is. I certainly don't know the serial number. They may or may not know the location. but. Uh, they should fill out as much information as they can on these forms. Uh, and here's a Florida form uh, that's the response. The first one was petitioner statement. This one is a respondent statement where he has to declare whether or not he has firearms or doesn't have firearms. We're going to stop a little bit here about um, Fifth Amendment issues. And the reality is that the law around this is still in flux. Uh, so we've given you sites to two cases uh, where one found that surrender of firearms to be testimonial, the other found that it was not testimonial. But the facts are very different, and uh, the legal strategy taken in each of these cases is different. So um, it's not, they're not exactly on point opposite to each other. And then down below, we've listed a couple of states where you know, some states have decided to grant immunity. Other states have these forms that require surrender, but doesn't specifically say anything on the form itself about Fifth Amendment concerns. And just as an example of that, that form we just looked at, the respondent's form from Miami, um, does not it just asks the respondent to fill it out, and, and you can see that that's an example of, of um, proceeding with the process without any specific um, reference to Fifth Amendment concerns. 
So we're going to move on from getting the information about firearms to the importance of issuing clear and enforceable surrender orders. Regardless of um, what jurisdiction you're in, we, we, we promote the, that courts and judges exercise all available authority. Um, you'll see from the title of the slide that we're talking about orders to surrender and or seize. In a handful of states, the order, th there are specific statutes around ordering seizure of the firearms in civil protection orders. That's uh, Massachusetts, Hawaii, New Jersey, and Illinois, as far as perhaps others. But in the vast majority of states, exercise all of the available authority is really talking about using your catch-all uh, provision in your protection order statute to order the surrender of firearms in a domestic violence case. We, um, the, it's also terribly important to be specific in your order, and that goes back to the obtaining of information. The more information that you have obtained about the identity of the weapons and the location of the weapons, um, the, the more specific the order can be, um, and that's helpful because you want to be able to identify which firearms are supposed to be surrendered or seized, where are they, and how will the abuser surrender them. The more concrete and specific those provisions are, the more, easy, the more easily it's enforced. You also want to remember to set a date for compliance with the order so that, again, it's clear to the, to the uh, respondent what, what's the deadline for doing the, uh, accomplishing the surrender and to also ensure that the respondent knows the penalty for disobeying that order. And here we have an example of a New York firearm surrender order. It's not the actual form, but it's the language from the form. And you'll see that um, it's the, the order itself um, that tells the respondent that that he's been ordered to surrender any and all firearms owned or possessed, but not limited to the following, and there's space to list specific firearms. Um, and then it also informs the respondent that his license to carry, possess, or you know otherwise have a firearm is permanently revoked or suspended until a certain date. And continuing with the New York form, it also um, says details when the surrender will take place um, at, and at, a, at what time and on what date and in one location and um, notifies law enforcement that they should report back to the court regarding compliance with that order. So that's a good example of a surrender for order um, that, cover, that has some good specificity in it. So the other uh, important thing with issuing clear and enforceable orders is to comply with the federal firearm prohibition requirements. And these are things that we went over in the last webinar, but um, the, under the language of 18 U.S. Code 922 G 8 and 9, it's important for the language in the order to, to have to explicitly prohibit the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force, or to have a provision about the respondent being a credible threat to the physical safety of the protected party. That language is essential in order for the order to fall under the federal law. You may have state law that is more, you know, is less specific, but if you're relying on the federal law for the prohibition of the firearms, the, one of those two provisions has to be true. And again, you might want to look back to that first webinar if you're wanting that language. Also has to have some indication of the relationship because it is about intimate partners and in the under the federal firearms provision, it has to be a co-parent or a present or former spouse or cohabitant. So, and, and it's important to to recognize that for the purposes of just issuing a protection order, 
follow your state law, but generally there's not a relationship that has to be there, an intimate relationship. And for full faith and credit, there does not have to be an intimate relationship. But for federal firearms law, there has to be a relationship, an intimate relationship, and it's best if you actually put that on the order itself. Right, because what will happen is that the enforcement of this will be taking place at some other point, but you just want to be sure that the order itself is clear about what the relationship is so that it can be enforced if it's an applicable order. Um, under the, obviously noting the compliance with due process, um, protection orders that are subject to the firearms prohibition, notice of the hearing and opportunity to be heard are both required under the federal law um, and under most, <laughs> most state laws, I think. Um, so because the provision kicks in after the um, order is, is entered as a final, not in the ex parte order. Um, and then, of course, to include notification of the firearm prohibition on the order itself and during discussion during the courtroom, uh, during colloquy. Um, and consent orders can comply with federal laws as well if they have the requisite language that we talked about above and if they show the relationship. So um, a consent order is okay as long as it has the right language. So a few more things about issuing enforceable orders. <coughs> um, these are things that go towards the collaboration that we talked about earlier. It's really important to have a collaborative, good collaboration with your firearm, with your local law enforcement agency because they are, of course, the ones that are going to be enforcing it, those prohibitions. <coughs> Excuse me. And to facilitate the enforcement of the provisions, you want to ensure that those orders are entered timely into state and federal databases. You want to encourage law enforcement to develop a protocol and train their personnel to ensure that they are including an accurate Brady indicator. That Brady indicator is, is the prohibition on purchasing a firearm that we talked about at the beginning, the Brady Act. Um, and there's just like a box somewhere on their paperwork that indicates yes or no, are they prohibited? And it's important that that box be checked and to have a protocol to make sure that people are checking that box. And to um, both law enforcement and the courts to respond to requests for information from NICS promptly. NICS is the federal program that implements the Brady indicators. So it you know, actually conducts the background check. And then to work closely with FBI on auditing the system to make sure that those uh, that that the that the orders are getting entered properly so that the prohibitions that are in the federal law can be implemented and I would just say another thing on the orders is if the order says that um, you're going to grant possession of the home or the apartment to the petitioner then make sure it also says that, again, the respondent can't go there, the respondent can't go get his guns, he has to leave immediately um, and not go back, and that there can be arrangements with the local police to go get his things. One of the things that that does is that now allows, if there are, in fact, guns in the home, that allows the petitioner to grant access to the home to the police to search for weapons in the home, because she's now in charge and she's the only one that needs to um, give approval at that point. So we're going to move on again to another one of these elements, which is ensuring parties understand terms, obligations, and enforcement. We're going to look at, again at, at Wisconsin uh, for a little bit here. But so the respondent gets a form called the Information for Respondents Regarding the Surrender and Return of Firearms and it includes a re the statement of possession of firearms and says, you know, if the restraining order is issued, you have to surrender your firearm. And the form basically again says, I want to surrender 
uh, to the sheriff, or I want to surrender my firearms to a person I choose who is approved by the judge. If, uh, if you do surrender, if you do allow the surrender to a third party, make sure that person is actually at the hearing where you're going to surrender the firearms. Um, in some jurisdictions, they have them actually sign an affidavit that says that I understand that I'm going to be receiving these firearms, that the respondent cannot have any possession or control over these firearms, including what you do with them, what this third party does with them, and that um, the judge, and then you can also put on that form that, you know, it's aiding and abetting a federal felony if, in fact, you do allow transfer back to the individual or uh, let him have some control over the firearm. And then have them sign that. And, and I don't ever, I can't remember the court, but one of the judges I was talking to one time says, having the person there, giving them all of that information, and then asking them to sign the affidavit, almost everybody then chooses not to do so. So, um, and there is a federal uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, Henderson versus United States, decided in the last couple of years, that talks about third party uh, surrender of firearms. It's a felony case, but it's still talking about the same section of the firearm statute. <coughs> And um, basically what it says is that, you know, the court can make sure, can ensure, it doesn't say exactly say how, there's an example or two, but says that um, we can, uh, the court has the ability to assure themselves um, that the felon will not retain control over his guns. Uh, and the site for uh, the Henderson case, is, uh, yeah, uh, 135 Supreme Court 1780 and 191 LED 2nd 874. And uh, it was done in uh, 2015. So essentially, even though third party transfer is acceptable and validated by the, that decision, it does um, encourage courts to to have a process for ensuring that the third party is aware of what I mean that the judge and the court should feel comfortable that the third party is the right person to be giving it to and you can do that by following the example of Wisconsin by having the third party be present and as Steve was mentioning have the have them acknowledge that um, in writing that they know what the responsibility is if they accept the, the firearm. And if what I would do is on this last bullet point about the third party also gets a copy of the notice is actually to have a place on there for them to sign an acknowledgement that they were given that information and they understand it. And then there's no backing out on their part saying, well, I didn't know. Okay, so um, the next part of the process is serving the process, and we uh, just want to talk a little bit about using that part of the process as an opportunity to obtain firearms. Um, again, this goes back to the emphasis on collaboration. A, a lot of this has to do with working with your law enforcement agency to ensure that service of the protection order is timely and that orders are entered into local, state, and federal registries and databases, and to encourage the development of a protocol so that safety planning is involved, especially if there's a specific order in the protection order, or a par sometimes jurisdictions have a separate surrender order on firearms, so you'll have the protection order and then you have a you know simultaneous surrender order that gets served along with it. Um, and obviously some safety planning is advisable for the, both for the protection of law enforcement, but also particularly for the victim uh, to know that that kind of order is being served and, and, and to do that in a safe way. Um, and to get information from the 
from the victim to facilitate safe service and recovery of the firearms pursuant. To, uh, and so in some counties, like this, we have two examples, one Maryland, one in California, where they have such protocols for obtaining information. And then to do to notify the victim and do some follow-up safety planning if they aren't surrendered for some reason during service. We have an example of a form from Jefferson County in Kentucky, Louisville, um, that just is a pretty straightforward form. Um, the form disappears at the bottom of the page, but there would be some lines underneath. Again, it is uh, pretty clear that you just this is law enforcement checking off whether or not you've advised, wh whether the respondent advised that he had no firearms, or whether they, the respondent failed to surrender, or whether the respondent did surrender. And then if they did surrender, you would note on the lines below what firearms were surrendered. This form would get faxed over to the court, and um, that way the court knows that the surrender was accomplished or not. And we're going to move on to the next element, monitoring, monitoring compliance. So again, as we said, you know, use very clear, specific orders, including specific deadlines. So don't just say uh, you're required to surrender your firearm. Give them a date certain on which that has to be done. Uh, provide clear instructions. Who do you turn them into? What? How does the process work? Uh, what type of proof does the respondent have to give, whether it's to the court or to the police? Wh what does he have to do to make sure that he's in compliance? And then uh, make sure that there are specific people in your court system and in your law enforcement uh, who handle these surrenders. And of course, you want them to get trained uh, on what's required and uh, how to do so safely. As uh, Nancy said earlier, you know, get some kind of review method so that you know, in fact, it's been complied with. And again, Jennifer, that's an example, again, of how you would know whether or not something has happened if your court system has some kind of monitoring compliance. So you can do direct communication, so there's an affidavit that they file, you can set a hearing, uh, and if you do so, then um, make sure that the respondent, the burden is on the respondent to provide proof of compliance. And again, you can do this through review hearings. Some communities use very tight probation at that period or other court-related officials to make sure that that gets done at that time. Um, and then you want to have a method, what do we do when he doesn't comply, right? So issue search warrants if that's available, arrest warrants if that's available under your law. Um, set and uh, have these show cause or contempt hearings. Uh, and report noncompliance to the prosecutor. It's, it's a, in most jurisdictions, it's a criminal law to violate the protection order. Uh, and this is a clear violation. Um, of that protection order. And again, we're going to look at some slides, or some forms, I mean. So here's, uh, I think there's four forms. Okay. So the first one is this proof of surrender form out of Washington. And again, it's something that the respondent would fill out, the restrained person, uh, which um, then allows you know, them to actually make the proof of surrender to the court. The, the next one is a declaration of non-surrender. So uh, I certify under the law, uh, they've told me that I have to send them in. I've not surrendered uh, because I do not have any of these items and I understand that I uh, can't possess any of them anyway. And again, signed by uh, the respondent. And the next one is an example of where you would turn them into the sheriff. So the sheriff then gets this receipt 
Um, and again, you see where the signature of the owner uh, is required on there. And then, uh, finally, uh, an order to show cause why respondent failed to surrender. So here's the order then that says you were supposed to turn him in on this date. You didn't do so. Therefore, uh, you have to appear in the court to show cause why you should not be held in contempt. Um, and um, again, requires then the court to have a hearing um, to be able to actually enforce the order um, in that case. Uh, now we'll move on to the next one. Okay. So the final part of an effective system is to make sure that you have a safe and effective firearms return process. We asked about this at the beginning of the webinar, and this is something that is an important thing to have delineated because it helps facilitate a, a whole system. Um, if the state law or existing protocols in your jurisdiction don't address the return of firearms, the court should develop a process. Um, Many states require respondents to petition for returns. You'll see a list there of New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Miami. Um, in, in other states, law enforcement petitions to prevent the return, as in California. So every jurisdiction has a, a slightly different process, but um, it's, it's quite common to have uh, the court would have a form for petitioning for having the respondent petition for the return. Um, Part of the protocol that's good to have as part of that is to have the court conduct or have law enforcement conduct um, a criminal background check before the return. Because what can happen is even though the protection order may expire and the respondent is no longer subject to that protection order, so that he is no longer under that prohibition for owning a firearm, um, there may be something else that has happened in the meantime. He may have a, or, or he may have some other reason why he's prohibited from possessing a firearm. So it's important to do that background check before the return of the firearm. And part of that should be looking to see whether or not there's any intervening protection orders in any other jurisdiction, okay. plus any in your own. And again, like we were just saying, that um, there can be other prohibitions on return. Either federal law might provide other prohibitors, or your own state law. And depending on whether he, ha what, what his, what the respondent's position was both before and after the protection order itself, um, it's difficult to identify illegal weapons. But it, there, are, there, that's another thing to be aware of as you're returning firearms. Um, also to use the equivalent of a Brady affidavit for a nationwide search. And essentially that would be the law enforcement agency utilizing some kind of form that has the same content as the, that the NICS program uses to ensure that you're looking at all of the things that might be, might flag the uh, respondent as being prohibited from getting his firearms back. And as Steve was talking earlier about third-party transfers, it's good to have a protocol with forms to um, prevent sham transfers to third parties, um, whether it's a process, as, as um, Steve was mentioning, where in court you have the third party present and signing a form, acknowledging that they know what um, what the responsibility is if they accept that transfer. Um, the ATF has an acknowledgment form, um, but the protocol it, it could include the requirement that a third party appear in court as a part of a good process that ensures that the third parties really understand what it is that they're accepting when they um, accept third party transfer. And of course, um, this is probably obvious, but a third party transfer is in lieu of the, um, releasing the firearm to a licensed dealer or, or some other, you know, governmental agency that, so the third party transfer is an option that the respondents 
sometimes once because they want to not give it to a dealer. And can we, after this, can we attach a, an example of a Brady affidavit to the materials or send it out? Um, I don't know if we can attach it to Mark. Yes, we can attach it to this, but we can we, I, we can send, make one available. Yeah. Okay, we'll make a Brady affidavit available. And here's a, a form for the motion uh, for return of weapons. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. This is just an example of a good of a form from the state of North Carolina for um, a respondent's motion for return of firearms surrendered. And you'll see that it asks the respondent to um, fill out whether they are subject to other criminal charges or if they've been convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence. Um, so that's a fairly comprehensive motion that gets asked the respondent to, uh, to identify those things. So those were the six elements uh, that we've gone through. And we just wanted to uh, sort of wrap this up and then we're going to we'll have time for questions uh, afterwards. But um, again, for the statistics, right? So 94% of female victims were murdered by a male they knew. And from those who knew their offenders, uh, they were either wives or intimate acquaintances with their killers. Uh, so you can see that you know um, firearms are, is especially dangerous um, in these kinds of cases and just for females in general. Uh, and over the years, there's been a decline in intimate partner homicide in general, but the proportion of females murdered has been increasing. And they think the reason for that is that women now have more resources available to them to deal with domestic violence, and so the number of women killing their partners has gone down much more drastically than males killing their partners with firearms. And this slide talks about judicial leadership because this, these have both been marketed basically to judges, but we know there's other people on there. So I, I just want to say to you judges, you know, if you don't have these kinds of things in your in your jurisdiction, you know, you have a leadership obligation um, to um, to take a position and to take some leadership in trying to get some of this done in your community, whether it's forms, protocols. Uh, processes within your court, whatever you need to do. Uh, but leadership is not just for judges. Every one of the stakeholders has an obligation, uh, if nothing else, to say, we don't have this kind of process. What can we do to get it? And um, you know, the court does have influence over the other stakeholders. If judges call a meeting, generally they will show up. Um, in addition, uh, if you call a meeting and provide food, people really will show up. Uh, so you know you can judges can effectively and ethically impact court systems. Right? You can engage in leadership both on and off the bench. Sometimes leadership on the bench can be relatively simple. So such that uh, to the prosecutor or to uh, uh, an advocate or somebody, have we checked to see whether or not there's any firearms in this case? If you ask that in every case, pretty soon people know you want that information and they'll start giving you that information. And the ethics laws have now changed over most of the country, not all, but over most of the country. So the new ABA model code, for instance, talks about uh, the judges are encouraged to engage and that participation in both law-related and other activities help integrate judges into the community. And again, I think that applies to all of the other stakeholders as well. And then finally, we just want to make sure that people understand that 
you know, when, when you have good communication, when you have good collaboration, it really can save lives. And let me put in another pitch for a coordinated community response of some sort or a DV council. They have different names across the country. But if you don't have one, you should form one. Uh, if you have one and it's not very active, then I think all of you have a leadership uh, duty to get it more active. Uh, and if you have one, make sure that decision makers are actually going to these meetings, not somebody that if you have a meeting once a month, and you have to wait till the following month because the person there has to go and ask, and it has to go through the bureaucracy to get a response back. Maybe you'll have it in a month. Maybe you'll have it in two months. So you want to make sure that, um, that you're having good um, communications with uh, the other. With decision makers. Yes, and, and with your other stakeholders. So before we go to our last slide, uh, let's see, uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, they want us to answer? We have 10 minutes or so. Um, seeing a comment here about the fact that someone's a volunteer, um, and I agree completely that um, Everybody who works with victims, survivors, everybody in the system, whether you're a court personnel or uh, wor working off-site at a, at a, you know, with at a shelter, that there's a role for talking about both the safety concerns around the firearms and the increased lethality, increased risk to the to the uh, victim from the presence of firearms. So there's a role for everybody, and I think. Also, even as a volunteer, and I shouldn't say even because the volunteers are essential, um, there usually is an opportunity for you to be involved in the local task force, go to meetings, listen in, see what's being discussed. Um, and as Steve just mentioned, I think even if there isn't any existing conversation around specific protocols around firearms forfeitures, you can start with small conversations and whether it's um, just a few advocates getting together and coming up with a draft of what they think would make sense and then taking it to the law enforcement agency and you know getting those conversations started. In the end, you have to have the decision makers there to adopt stuff, those kinds of things, but everybody has a potential role in, in getting those conversations moving forward. So there's also this question that I'm going to let Steve <laughs> respond to uh, from yeah. Michael Kaplan about the preferred method for addressing firearms owned and assigned to law enforcement officers. Um, okay, so one of the things that's important to know that if it's a domestic violence injunction, under federal law there is an official use exemption. That exempts the police officer from the federal law so they can possess a firearm but it has to be their duty weapon, and it has to be only in their possession while they're on duty. Now, some police departments require officers um, to be on duty 24-7, so they can keep their firearm with them 24-7. But again, it's only their official police firearm. Other departments make people check their firearm out when they go on shift, and then you can uh, get the firearm back, or you have to turn it back in then at the end of your shift. And it's really important to also understand what exactly, um, yes, they, they are still obligated to surrender all their other firearms, right? And if, they're on, if they are not on duty, if they're suspended, uh, then they're not going to be on duty anyway. And so they're not allowed to have any weapons. But um, uh, yeah, and oftentimes during the pendency of a protection right. order, they'll be put on a different duty. Um, and make sure you know exactly what it is that they're doing. So, for instance, um, you can be a correctional officer, um, but you may not ever carry a weapon on duty. Uh, and so, obviously, when you're off duty, you can't you can't claim somehow that you know the uh, official use exemption applies. And it only applies to public uh, 
um, officers, uh, like police officers, uh, correctional officers, who are required to carry a weapon. So if you're working in a private prison, you, the official use exemption does not apply to you. There's another question from Judge Kelly about how the gun lock procedure worked, and the gun locks were referred to in some of these comments above. Um, I'm, it was something new to me, but the idea of um, having the respondent purchase gun locks uh, or reimburse law enforcement, I think. Um, so I, I'm not familiar with the process that was being talked about. I think it was Michael looks like Fred is responding to that, but um, the idea of having gun locks and having them release the gun locks to law enforcement sounds like a great idea to me. And, and Brett, uh, thank you so much for your comments, and I would encourage everyone to go back and look through the chat uh, and uh, read what Brett's been posting, because uh, he's made, made some very good points in those. Uh, any other questions? I also just want to emphasize that uh, although we've put a few forms in here and we made this uh, link, a set of links so that you could get those forms directly, um, that we do technical assistance for jurisdictions on firearms removal. And if you would like to contact either one of us, um, we have a host of other forms from different jurisdictions, uh, depending on what your needs are. and. So it's not just these these forms that are in this set of links. Any other questions from anyone? Can you come to Austin? Uh, give me a call. My phone number is on there. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And um, a couple of people are typing, so let's, let's okay. see what they have to say first. I would say also that if any of you are using forms in your jurisdiction that you think are particularly helpful, I would love to have um, either links to them or, or fax copies or PDFs, whatever you can send me. Um, we are in the process of assembling a sort of library of resources on these things, and it's super helpful to have good forms uh, for other jurisdictions that are trying to work out these problems. OK. Well, thanks, all of you, so much uh, for attending and asking questions. And again, uh, here's our contact information on this last slide. Uh, we also have put the National Center for Protection Orders and Full Faith and Credit and their contact information because they also do some work around firearms. And we, foc we tend to focus on courts and judges, but because the essence of this work is multidisciplinary, we, we, you know, we, we certainly work with all, all professions, but especially invite courts and judges to contact us. Got a couple more typers. Yes, I we I will um, well, probably just have a Brady affidavit sent out to the everybody who registered for the webinar. Right. And Judge Kelly, we'll see what we can do about that. Okay, well, it looks like that's about it, and we're about out of time. Again, thank you, everybody. Um, we appreciate um, you attending and participating in this. And with that, we will sign off.